Everybody's talking about the US dollar. And nobody's taking for granted its continued global dominance anymore. With the world seemingly more polarized with each passing day, the king dollar, the most visible symbol of American hegemony, is caught in the growing battle between globalism and nationalism, between the global north and the global south, and between the unipolar world and the multipolar one. Last week, the Brazilian president told the world that he spent every night asking himself why all countries have to base their trade on the dollar. He wanted to know who was it that decided the dollar would take over after the end of the gold standard. Three days later, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, whose signature is on the dollar bills, admitted on CNN that sanctions against Russia could undermine the hegemony of the dollar. Of course, it does create a desire on the part um, of China, of Russia, of Iran um, to find an alternative. Donald Trump, the Republican presidential candidate currently leading in the polls, is accusing the Biden administration of allowing China to displace the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard, which will be our greatest defeat, frankly, in 200 years. There will be no defeat like that. That will take us away from being even a great power. Given the centrality of the dollar to the global economy, its future should be a concern for all as even a small change to the status will likely be felt keenly around the world, from Wall Street to Main Street. So how vulnerable is the dollar exactly? If everyone is moving away from it, why is it still so strong? With the dollar not far from its all-time high, who and what are propping it up? In what way is the U.S. still benefiting from having the U.S. dollar as a primary reserve currency? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. The U.S. dollar has many natural advantages. Jenny Yellen gave the examples of the robust U.S. capital markets and rule of law. These are important factors, but many advanced economies have robust capital markets and rule of law. In other words, they are necessary but not sufficient conditions for a reserve currency. In an earlier video, I talked about two aspects of the U.S. economy that make the dollar truly special. One, exports are a relatively small share of the U.S. economy. This means the U.S. is less sensitive to a strong currency than more open economies. Two, the U.S. is the world's technology leader. This means U.S. exports often sit at the top of the value chain. This means U.S. exports do not have to compete on prices alone. The most important condition for a global reserve currency is that its issuer has to be able to live with a strong currency. The fact that the U.S. economy can handle a strong currency more easily than any other economy is the real safeguard of the dollar's reserve currency status. It will be many years before the RMB will be in a position to seriously challenge the dollar hegemony. The fact that currency is a reserve currency does not mean it's strong all the time. The dollar has been the undisputed global reserve currency for five decades, but it has gone up and it's gone down. Despite the talk of the dollar's demise as the global reserve currency, the dollar is currently trading near its highest level since the start of the modern floating exchange rate era in 1973. Why is the dollar so strong right now? What is propping it up? By definition, a reserve currency enjoys greater demand than non-reserve currencies. To meet increasing foreign demand for the dollar, the U.S. has to run a current account deficit. Indeed, the U.S. has been running almost a persistent current account deficit since the 1980s. As a result, foreign holdings of U.S. assets have been going up steadily. Today, foreign holdings of U.S. assets stand at $48 trillion. How much is $48 trillion? Think about it this way. The market capitalization of the entire U.S. stock market is only $40 trillion. The total outstanding U.S. marketable treasury debt comes to only $23 trillion. So $48 trillion is a lot of money, 
no matter how we look at it. What is the composition of foreign ownership of U.S. assets? Well, foreigners currently own about $7.5 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, about a third of the total outstanding stock. More importantly, today they hold more than $12 trillion of U.S. stocks and investment funds, and another $10 trillion of equities in the form of direct investment into U.S. corporate entities. The Tax Policy Center estimates foreign holdings of U.S. corporate equity are now at 40%. This is up from just 11% in 1980 and 25% in 2000. Of course, U.S. residents have been accumulating foreign assets too. However, U.S. holdings of foreign assets are much smaller, at just $32 trillion. The difference between the two, which is called the net international investment position, is at minus $16 trillion for the U.S. What is remarkable is that it was only a little more than a decade ago that this number was just minus $3 trillion. $16 trillion is a whopping 65% of U.S. GDP. How did it happen that the net liabilities of the U.S. to foreigners increased by more than 500% since the end of the Great Recession in 2010? Is this massive liability a harbinger of problems to come for the U.S. dollar? The only reason why a country would want to be an issuer of reserve currency is because it gets to borrow more cheaply than it would otherwise. This is what the former French President Charles de Gaulle called the exorbitant privilege. If foreigners are willing to hold U.S. assets for lower returns than what Americans are able to get out of foreign assets, it would allow Americans to permanently consume more than they produce. It would be like charging a fee on the rest of the world for using the U.S. dollar. For a very long time, the fact that the U.S. was able to run a trade deficit without racking up big net liabilities to foreigners was thought of as evidence of this exorbitant privilege. But this started to change 10 years ago. What changed is that U.S. assets began to produce higher returns than foreign assets. Since 2011, U.S. stock market has gone up 390%, while that of the rest of the world went up by only 160%. During the same period, U.S. bonds have returned 28%, while global bonds have returned only 7%. What this means is that the exorbitant privilege of the U.S. dollar has been turned on its head. Foreigners are now earning more on U.S. assets than Americans are earning on foreign assets. Faster price appreciation and higher bond yields help foreign holdings of U.S. assets to climb more than U.S. holdings of foreign assets over the past decade. The net result is that today the U.S. owes $16 trillion to foreigners. So much for the exorbitant privilege. The implication of the above is that the dollar has done well because foreigners are attracted by the higher returns offered by U.S. assets, U.S. stocks in particular. So why have U.S. stocks consistently outperformed foreign stocks over the past decade? The efficient market hypothesis tells us that this should not have happened. Well, rather, it could happen only if U.S. stocks are much riskier than foreign stocks and that U.S. stocks have to pay an extra premium to attract buyers. But this is clearly not the case, as the U.S. stock market is generally viewed as one of the safest stock markets in the world. So what's going on? Three economists at UCLA and the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis recently looked at this puzzle and came up with a good explanation. In a paper entitled, The End of Privilege, a Reexamination of the Net Foreign Asset Position of the United States, they argued that the outperformance of U.S. stocks over the past decade reflect an unexpected rise in the profitability of the U.S. corporate sector, which reduces the share of value-added going to labor and capital and increases the share going to the owners of monopolistically competitive firms who are increasingly foreigners. A lot to unpack here, but what they're basically saying is that the importance 
of monopolies or near monopolies with high profit margins have gone up in the U.S. over the past decade. What they are saying is that this trend is driving the outperformance of U.S. stocks over the past decade. Their conclusion is powerful because you don't have to be an economist to get it. Just think Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Meta. Five of the ten biggest U.S. companies in terms of their market capitalization. They all enjoy monopoly or near monopoly status in their respective markets. They all have very high profit margins and have experienced massive earnings growth and massive stock price appreciation over the past ten years. Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon have gone up around 1,000 percent each since 2011. Google, 700 percent. Even Meta has gone up more than 500 percent. These days, their monopolistic power also comes from the fact that they're cash machines. This means that they have almost unlimited budget for research and development. This means that they can buy up technologies that they don't have, or competitors that they fear. The supremacy of these companies is the reason why the U.S. dollar is so strong, and the U.S. dollar hegemony has no competition right now. So what's the bottom line? The future of the U.S. dollar does not depend on whether China is paying for Saudi oil in RMB or in U.S. dollar. This is because while the Saudis may agree to get paid in RMB, it does not mean that it will keep its money in RMB. The future of the dollar depends on whether the Saudis or any other country decide to keep their money in RMB or in the U.S. dollar. This decision will be made based on two considerations. One, what returns they think they will get on their investments in the U.S. versus in China. Here, the consideration is a bit of a no-brainer, if you ask me. The Chinese stock market has been the worst performing, while the U.S. stock market has been the best performing in the world over the past decade. Two, which countries offer safer investments? Biden administration's decision to freeze all Russian reserves sitting in dollars has set a dangerous precedent. That would no doubt make any country that is not a democracy think twice before putting all their money in the dollar. Let's hope Jenny Yellen meant it when she said the U.S. will resort to the weaponization of the dollar judiciously. Otherwise, even Google and Microsoft won't be able to save the dollar. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come check us out at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.